Good afternoon to each of you. Um, I, I understood a little bit of what you were asking. It, uh, are you going to have actually translation and or available on the microphones? Auf Deutsch? For dir? Nein? Okay. <laughs> In Danish. Uh, Danish, okay. Um, well, we're grateful to be here. We, we've just come in from South America. Uh, I was in Suriname, installing a television network in Suriname, uh, in Dutch, English, and Taki Taki, which is the national dialect. And my wife stayed in Bolivia, and she was doing vacation Bible school in two, two small towns. So she did one week in one town with all the children, and one week in another town. And so our planes were supposed to meet in Frankfurt, no, in Stuttgart, uh, within five minutes of each other. We were supposed to land at the same time. But as it turned out, her flight, due to bad weather, did not leave Bolivia until 24 hours late. So we met a day later. I drove up to Frankfurt, and we changed the flight, and I, I was able to pick her up. And, uh, and so we then spent a couple days trying to catch up with jet lag and uh, getting some rest before we came here. Uh, from here, we will go to, to uh, Romania then to Austria, then to Bulgaria, and then to Holland, and then we'll fly back to the U.S. and immediately begin a whole week of camp meeting with, with a Jerem, Pastor Jeremiah Davis. I don't know if you know him, but we're very good friends, and he recently came down to Bolivia with his family, and we enjoyed our time in Peru and Bolivia together. So we're happy to be here, and we're thankful for the opportunity. My, this is my wife's first time in, in uh, Denmark, She's been to Norway with me several times, but first time for Denmark. So she's very happy that we could come together. And so if, if it's okay with you, uh, uh, as we begin, we'd like to open with a word of prayer. If you would just bow your heads with us, please, as we begin. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, Lord, for the opportunity we have of being here together. We are here to share. We are here to learn. We are here to, to catch a glimpse of the preparation process for the crisis ahead and for the great work that you have prepared for your people. We ask you to accompany us and we ask you to, for the Holy Spirit to bless us, to impress us, to convict us, and to use us, we pray. Control every word, every thought, every, every action. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we, we have been asked to, to share two different parts. Uh, the uh, first part will be mainly uh, interaction with my wife and I and some, some illustrations of what, what God has led us, a little bit of history. Some of you already have heard, have n already we've been together, and some is for the first time. But uh, we'd like to give you a little bit of background because sometimes some of the things we share, you would say, where in the world did they come up with that? How did they get into that difficult situation? And so I just wanted to share a little bit uh, as a background of why we're doing this, um, of why we enjoy our work um, very much, and uh, what God has done for us. Uh, when I was one year old, my parents, I was born in the U.S., my parents uh, moved to Bolivia. My father is a pastor and a pilot. They're reti he's retired now. And my mother is a registered nurse. And uh, together they moved down with m myself and my youngest brother who was just born, we moved to Bolivia. Uh, I was raised in the jungles of Bolivia. And a few years later, another missionary family moved from the United States to Bolivia, and it was her family. But they lived, they lived up in the mountains, in the Andes Mountains, and, uh, where it's cold and very high. Uh, and so every time we had to go to, the, go to the mountains, we stayed in their house. And every time they came to the jungles, they stayed in our house. And she became my best friend from the time I was three years old. And so she was my best friend, and we grew up together in Bolivia. When I was eight years old, I decided that she was the person I was going to marry. So I asked her to marry me. I bought her a bottle of perfume, and I asked her to marry me, and she agreed to marry me. And, uh, but then we didn't see each other for almost 10 years. And we met again when I was, when I was 18 years old. And uh, we, went, we entered the university together. And um, halfway through nursing, 
uh, we took nursing together. I started first taking some theology classes, and then that's when I met her uh, again, and, and uh, we took nursing together also and aviation together. We studied flying together. So you can see we did a lot of things. And we were married, and uh, I asked her to marry me in the airplane. And, uh, and, and then we've been serving together all our lives. We have five children, uh, two biological daughters, and then one adopted daughter and two adopted sons. So we have a whole variety. Every one of us are dual citizens. My wife and I are also Bolivian citizens. And uh, uh, we have a daughter who's a, a United States and Brazilian uh, citizen. And we have another daughter who is United States and Australian citizen. And then we have um, a son who is adopted Mexican and, and U.S. and Peruvian and U.S. So you can see you can see that we have a wide variety of, of cultures in our family, and we're glad to have the opportunity now to be here in Europe. Initially, uh, I had agreed to have a, uh, four or five days in Holland, uh, a speaking appointment. There's a very large church there that every year or so I come back to speak in that church in Holland, um, which is not so far from here. And, um, but then all of a sudden, Denmark said, please, 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 if Uncle David is going to be in Europe, we need him up here too. And Bulgaria said, please, please. And Romania said, please, please. And so in the end, it ended up being that we were going to be speaking in five countries. So, and Becky, this is the first time for you in Denmark. Tell me what, tell us what, what you think of Denmark. Your first, oh, you've only been here one day. What, what do you think? Oh, it, it's, is this on? Hello? It is on? Okay. Um, well, I think it's very beautiful, and I, I wish I could spend a little more time, but we had fun today. Uh, we went to the castle. It's not too far to see that, and yeah, it looks like very, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she didn't prepare to be able to speak here, so she's a little nervous and a little <laughs> shy. She's always been. You can imagine a little student nurse knocking on the door saying, I'm going to be your nurse today. So it's, it's very difficult and painful for her to meet new faces and, and introduce herself. But, but she's, she's gotten better at it over the years. And she does a lot of presentations, too, for children and other things. But, uh, and Becky, many people wonder. They hear me speak. I tell them about the stories. Uh, I, we tell them about flying and working in countries, being hijacked, being in prison. Uh, being, we'll share some of those stories again. Uh, maybe being assaulted by armed uh, thieves and so on. But, but you, you are, you're a missionary wife, and you had to go through some of these things too, or you were wondering where I was or why didn't I, can, I didn't come home. And uh, what was it that sustained you? What makes you, uh, what makes you able to work in a difficult country where there's difficult situations, and you don't know if you're going to live or die if your husband's coming home or not? Well, I guess the first thing is that um, the Bible says that God gives us the desires of our heart, especially when we're trusting in him. And one of my great desires, since I grew up as a missionary kid, I really wanted to get married to a missionary. And of course, um, I immediately, when we were friends with David, and then for many years didn't see him, and I would kind of look around to see if there's anybody else like David. And I kept telling the Lord, I want someone like David. <laughs> so I'm so thankful that the Lord did give, give me that opportunity to marry David. And, and so I guess that's one of the reasons that even though sometimes life has been very difficult, um, I was really, it was the desires of my heart. And God was always there sustaining me. And, but... For the most part, I've just really, really enjoyed being a missionary and taking the love of Jesus to people who maybe have never heard of it before. And uh, I just love handing out Bibles and going to these little villages and talking to them about Jesus. To me, it's just so very, very special. And uh, I guess I always wanted to be a pilot, too, ever since I flew in the airplane with David's folks. That was also another big desire of my heart. And uh, when I got to university, I studied to be a pilot. And I've spent the last 39 years <laughs> flying beside David. 
So most of the time that's been fun. Every now and then it gets a little uh, scary. <laughs> bad weather. Uh, bad weather and things like that. It's stressful sometimes, but we've really enjoyed that. Another thing that, that God really gave me the desires of my heart was when we were, uh, when I was a child, my parents took in a little Bolivian girl. And ever after that, I wanted to also adopt. And so the Lord also gave me the desires of my heart in that area. And we legally adopted three children. Uh, but I've had many, many other daughters and sons and daughters that have lived with us through the years and still call us mommy and daddy and have been very close. So that, that also has been very special to me. Um, I remember in Germany, I was speaking one time and somebody came to you and said, I don't believe a word that Uncle David said unless you confirm it. <laughs> because many people can talk, 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 and you said what he said was true. He said, okay, I now believe it. <laughs> so in the mouth of two witnesses, because sometimes people can tell nice stories. But how, how easy has it been? You said it was sometimes difficult. Um, do, you, do you own a home of your own? Uh, or do you stay in, in missionary homes and other houses that, that belong to the, the project or people's houses? Where do you stay most of the time? <laughs> uh, that's wherever my suitcase happens to be. But the Lord <laughs> has been very, very good to us. And, and I do want to say right here real quickly, that I'm so grateful that I married David because um, as far as my spiritual life is concerned, it, it's just been such a huge blessing to learn how to depend more and more on God. And um, when we first decided to just live by faith, um, we didn't think we would ever have a home of our own. But it's just been amazing to see how God um, has given us a home. Right now we have a little home in Bolivia, and even though we're not there very often, <laughs> that is a whole miracle story. Um, we had gone to the state, well, we had gone to Bolivia to live after being in Guyana and Venezuela for many years, for about 14 years, we were in those two countries, and Venezuela was just getting very, very difficult to in, be in. In Guyana, the, we lived in an, an Indian community, and, and the they Indians built us built a, a, house. a little house for missionaries, and we stayed there for nearly six years. And we still stay there very often yeah. when we go to visit. Uh, they they usually have a room there available for us. We used to have clothes hanging in the closet, but they rotted after a while. Then yes, we came back and they were no good anymore. Uh, but we had a Russian family living there for the last four or five years, and we always stayed in our old house. And then in Venezuela, what kind of house? Oh, did we, we stay had. In? A, it was really a dream come true to me. We, had the, we lived in these little Indian huts with um, just the, the palm leaf. Oh, palm yeah, leaves. patch roof They built house. that for us, too. They built three little huts, two bedrooms, and one little kitchen. And that, was, that house is still there. And whenever we go to Venezuela, we, we stay in that. There we too. stay there, too. Mm -hmm. um, none of the other missionaries wanted to live in that house. They thought it was just too, too primitive, I guess. But to me, it was one of my very, very favorite houses. <laughs> And then after that, we went to Bolivia when things were just getting too difficult in Venezuela. So we went to Bolivia, and we were staying with my daughter and her, hu and her husband and two children. And it was just a little tiny, I mean really tiny, two-bedroom house. And they would go sleep with their kids, and we would sleep in their room, and we didn't feel very comfortable with that. So after a few years, we went to the States, um, for a few months, and I worked, and I brought back $300. And David said, why don't we build ourselves a house with this money? And I go, what? This time my husband is <laughs> kind of crazy. How does he think that's going to happen? But he said, well, with that money, we can do the, the foundation. We had a backhoe on the property. It's not, it's not our property. It belongs to the, the ministry, but but there's space on the property for houses. And so we decided to build, I got the backhoe and we dug all the footings and we spent $300 on cement and, and rebar, the metal. And so we were able to lay the foundation. All the, the missionaries helped. helped and so it was fun. But I thought, okay, this is as far as it's gonna get. I'm sure of it. 
You can't build a house with three hundred dollars. No, <laughs> but even in Bolivia, I mean, you can build it for lots cheaper than other places. But still, I was like, there's no way. But uh, we were getting ready to go back to the states on a trip, and and we just called our boys to let them know that we were coming. And they said, oh, Mommy and Daddy, did you hear that a tornado just went through here? And, um, oh, really? Well, one of our volunteers at our GMI office, um, her husband worked with a company that had a very good insurance plan. And she told her husband, I know that David and Becky are trying to build a little place down in Bolivia. Why don't we share some of that money that we get back? We don't need to fix up our house all fancy. Jesus is going to be coming soon. We don't need to get new cars for our, the cars that got destroyed in the tornado. Let's just get some used cars and let's share some of this money with David and Becky. And so that was a huge gift. And uh, we did nearly the whole house with the money that we got from that. And then it was just incredible how other people would hear about us trying to build a little house so for a total of about 20000 we were able to build a, it's a simple little house with just two bedrooms, but it's very comfortable, and we really enjoy it. And actually, we put it to use right away, because we had a lot of missionaries come in that didn't have any housing, and so since we had an extra bedroom, uh, first we ended up, first we took in some single people, and the next thing you knew, there were, uh, married couples until we could find another place for them to live and then the next thing we knew <laughs> we had families with kids we actually ended up with three families that had two kids so apiece, for four so years we had uh, families with children living in our next door bedroom right next to our bedroom and uh, finally after four years we said we don't even have a house every time we come <laughs> it really belongs to somebody else so we finally found a place for them, and now, now we go to Bolivia, and now yeah, we have for a the last few months, it's only mm -hmm. been us, but um, for the last few months, we've hardly been there to enjoy our house. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> anyway, that gives you an idea a little bit. Maybe, maybe tomorrow we'll have some pictures of some of these for you tonight. We didn't have a projector, and we didn't come prepared to show you, but it gives you an idea that what missionary life is like. It, you stay in a thatch roof house. You stay in a little wooden house. You stay in a little brick house. You stay with other families. You stay w in the office. We stayed for six months. Every day we'd uh, make, uh, lay out a couch, sleep on it, and we'd make it into a, 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 a sofa again, and then the, we'd carry on the regular work. So that gives you an idea. You have to be willing to be flexible. Yes, I think that's one of the biggest things. very important for missionary work. It, if you're not flexible, it's very hard to adjust to other cultures and other ways of sleeping and eating and so on. So. I know the older we get, the less flexible we get, right? Some of us have that white hair, uh, gray hair. We know that, that we get a little bit less flexible, flexible, a little less flexible here, and a little bit flex less flexible in our habits, too. But um, we've grown up with a lot of flexibility, but even with that, uh, it's nice. This may, may be one of, we may not travel as much anymore. We, we find that there's so many needs in the world that if we just stay in South America more, there's too much work for us anyway. So we may not come back very often to Europe, but I tried to come back once a year. But this time, this time we ended up with five speaking appointments in which we intended to have only one. But we're glad to be in Denmark. Thank you for the invitation. We thank, we're thankful to be here. Um, the, one of the questions people many times ask, and that is uh, uh, about salary. How much salary do missionaries make? Uh, do you receive a salary? Um, what are your health benefits? And, and, and those kind of things. And we tell people, well, God is our insurance plan. And God is, you know what health insurance? Health insurance is only good when you don't have health. You know that, right? <laughs> what, about that? what about life insurance? When is it good? When you're dead. When you're dead, right? <laughs> Does life insurance keep you alive? Does health insurance keep you healthy? No, health insurance is when you're sick. And life insurance is when you're dead. So the best insurance you can have is when God insures you, when God gives you health and life. So we have found, we have 300 missionaries working in different countries. We're, today we're working in about 94 countries uh, with projects in 94 countries. And we have 300 people and none of them have health insurance. But on the other hand, I only remember of one or two people that ever got sick. 
and and there was resources for them to cover that. So God keeps us healthy, and if there is a little incident of some kind, uh, God provides the resources to care for that. And so we we can we can thank God for His for His protection and care. Uh, the other question is how much stipend, how much money do you get? Well, some countries cost a little more than others. Uh, in, in, for example, in Bolivia, uh, a single person can live on $100 or $150 a month, approximately. Uh, a family may take, may, with children, maybe $300. Uh, other countries are more expensive. Um, some countries do require some kind of health plan, and we have to follow the law, and, and then you have to do that. Other countries don't. But we work within whatever the country requires. Uh, most third world countries don't require any health uh, coverage. Not like, like uh, well, here I think in Denmark you have the government provides you health care. In the United States they have been requiring everybody to carry health insurance. But since, since we don't receive a stipend and we don't receive a salary, uh, whenever Becky, my wife, works as a nurse when we're in the United States, um, then, then she makes a little bit of money and that's the only income we report, except that we report we have housing and we have food. That's part of our benefits, but it's not cash. And so we normally report that to the government, and the government says to us, you don't make enough money to have to buy insurance. So every year uh, we report what we make, what we get, and they tell us you're exempted from health insurance requirements. And uh, so we're glad we don't have to pay money every month for health insurance, and we haven't had to use it anyway. Uh, we've been healthy. Uh, what are the benefits of being a missionary? The benefits of being a missionary are that you learn to depend on God. We have to all learn to depend on God, even if you live in Denmark. Because someday, even in Denmark, the world situation is going to become more difficult. You know that. Uh, the storm is on the horizon. The world is not going to remain in the same stable condition forever. The storm will change all of the variables. And when that, when, that, when that storm hits, even in Denmark, people who have not learned to depend on God will have to, will have to learn. But how fast do we learn as people? Very slowly, right? All of us have hard heads. And it takes a while to learn. So the more we learn to depend on God, the easier it is to, to depend on Him in the future. So uh, I would suggest that no matter what your situation is, each of us needs to we need to ask God to teach us to depend on Him because we will need it. What is coming ahead, every single child of God will need to learn to depend solely on God. And so God might ask you to go beyond your comfort zone. God might ask you to give to support a needy person, a needy project, your local church, uh, a, needy, a needy country, what, whatever it is God impresses you, if you learn to give, even if it's uncomfortable to give, you will find that God will take care of you. Amen. And so you, the more experience you have with God, the easier it is in the, it will be for you in the future. Um, and Becky, you, you're involved in health work. You, you think you're, you're working with the health work in Bolivia what, and, and Bibles too. One of the things that you like to do is to, is to give Bibles away all around the Andes Mountains into the Indian villages. You travel to them. I don't like the Andes Mountains myself. Uh, I like the jungles. I grew up in the jungles, and being up at being up at three and four thousand meters high gives me a headache. It's cold. It's no oxygen, and and it's. I think it's miserable to be honest. <laughs> but she grew up there, and she likes it. And did you did you know that a person that grows up in the Andes Mountains has bigger lungs than everybody who grows up in the jungles? Your tidal volume. Breathing in and breathing out, your tidal volume increases because if you grow up in the mountains, your lungs have to make up for the lack of oxygen. And if you grow up as a child, your lungs naturally move more air to make up for that. So she likes to go to the Andes. I, I go sometimes, but m mainly I send her to the Andes Mountains when I have to go on a trip. I say, it's time for you to go to the Andes Mountains and hand out Bibles. <laughs> then I don't have to go along, you see. And, and so... And so, she, what do you like to do? Tell me about the Bibles. You, you love giving out Bibles and some of the health work. Yes, that you do. but we do also go to the jungle areas. You do go we've to the jungle too, and we've I go actually with gone stuff. to the, yeah, he went with me on that trip where we went to the Mamore River where we became really, really good friends when we were kids. And so, it was fun to go back to that area. But 
um, yeah, just this year, was this year, wasn't it? Yeah, this earlier, early in February, um, I decided to go up to a place called Oruro. One of our missionaries some time ago, actually he was from Germany, he and a friend had, they were volunteers there, and before he left back to his country, he decided to go to some of the mines up there in Bolivia. And they had gone down into this one mine, and uh, there they have, they a lot have of tin mines and uh, coal mines and things like that. There, all kinds of different minerals that they mine, and of course, it's pretty dangerous work. And so those people are quite superstitious, and they um, worship this god called Supai, and they think that they have to give him all these kind of gifts, otherwise. Um, he may punish them and cause the mine to fall on them, or, or maybe they won't find any minerals. And so they had gone down into a mine, and here was this shrine with this god, and it was just covered with all this confetti and cigarettes and coca leaves and all these money and other things that they had brought this god. But he said what impressed them the most, they had like a little altar, and they would put their candles there, and... At certain times of the year, they also sacrifice yamas. He said he just felt such a, a malignant, evil spirit down there. It, it just really shook him up, he and his friend, and they got out of there as quickly as they could. But they came back and they said, Aunt Becky, you really need to go give them Bibles. And so that was just really on my heart that I wanted to do that. So I started praying about it, and I decided to go in February because that's when they have a great big, what they call devil dances, where they have mixed paganism with Christianity. And um, I decided that would be a good time to hand out these Bibles and also some Bible lessons, study guides on what the Great Controversy was really all about. And so I was so thrilled when I got a donation uh, to, to get Bibles, and then we also got permission from um, Amazing Discoveries. Had to remember which one it was. <laughs> was it Amazing Facts who printed it? I mean, Amazing, fa yeah, amazing facts. facts, that's what it was. Amazing Facts to print up their, their Bible studies. They gave us permission to do that. So we printed up uh, 500 copies. Each, each, there's, a, there's like 17 co uh, yeah, there's different... Bible studies in a set, and so we printed up 500 sets. And um, it was really interesting to see how God started opening doors for all of this because he was asked to have, to officiate at a, a wedding ceremony. And so at the wedding, I asked the, the mother and father of the groom where they were from, and they said, Oruro, and I said, oh, that's where I'm planning to go. Uh, to hand out these Bibles, and they said, oh, please come to our house. And so, you know, they, we exchanged telephone numbers and everything, and they were just so sweet. I took a team of five people, and they put us up in their home so we didn't have to get any hotels. They came to pick us up at the bus station in their van, and they fed us, and then later when they were getting ready to go to the mines, the father said, oh, I used to work at the mines, and so I know all these different places. And he had a pickup truck, and so we loaded up all those Bibles and, and the Bible studies. We also did some literature on health, and so we took off for these mines, and it was just so interesting to meet these people and right at first, they were a little bit hesitant, like, uh, what are you doing? We said, we, want, we feel that Jesus is coming soon, and we want to help you to get ready. And so we want you to get to know Jesus, and we want to give you this Bible and, and these lesson studies. And they were like, well, how much is that going to cost? No, we want to just give it to you. Well, once they realized that it was <laughs> free, all of a sudden we got mobbed. <laughs> so... I don't know what to do in the future about that. <laughs> but they just came, and so many people around our little truck, that the poor little truck, I mean, it just blocked the whole road, and this policeman came running over, and what are you doing here? And so I showed him what we were handing out. He said, well, uh, there's a church right over there. 
can you please go over there and, and hand out the Bibles? <laughs> so uh, it was a Catholic church, so we went by the Catholic church and we handed out <laughs> the Bibles and Bible studies. And the thing that just really hurt me was that it just went so fast. And, and then the people, I still have a picture in my mind of them just reaching up and please, please give me a Bible. And I had to say, I'm sorry. There's no more Bibles. And there was one little girl that when we were over at the other side before they had us move, she was like, I want a Bible, I want a Bible. Well, she looked like she was only maybe seven. And I said, well, actually, we're giving it to the big people so that they can study. We want to make sure that they read it. Oh, but my mom can read. I said, well, is your mommy here? No, she's working in the market. Well, right then is when the policeman came and made us move. But then over at the other <laughs> side, she was there tugging at my sleeve like, please, please, I want a Bible. And her eyes were just so big and pleading. And so I said, OK, I'll try to get you a Bible. So I was telling my volunteer, please hand me a Bible, trying to reach over all these other people that were also reaching for the Bible. And several times she tried to hand me one, and each time it was snatched away. And, and then that's when they quit. And that little girl, she just started to cry her heart out. It just, I felt so, so sad that I hadn't given it to her right at first when she wanted it so badly. But I'm praying. I still pray. Not every day, but whenever I think about it, I pray that the Lord will help me find that little girl again and give her a Bible and some studies. And actually, as we were driving out, after we had finished handing everything out, we were going through the market, and I just happened to look to the side, and there I saw that little girl, and she was going like this to her mom, like, there, there, there they are, there they are. And I still have fixed in my mind where that was. So I'm just praying that the Lord will help me find her and give her one. <laughs> but anyway, I feel very blessed that I get the privilege of passing out these Bibles. I'm just so thankful for all the donors who, who I know sacrificed to help me get these Bibles. But I just say, man, if you want to come and have a really neat experience, just come with me on one of my mission trips. <laughs> you can see why we do what we do. It brings great joy. Some, most, most donations that most people that give to there, sometimes they come from Asia, like we just had a donation from, from Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it comes from the US, and sometimes it comes through our German account that we have there. Um, but Bibles, Bibles for Bolivia always gets sent. Any donation that says Bibles for Bolivia gets sent to Aunt Becky, and she personally goes with a team of people, and they hand them out in different villages. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. You know, unlike I was handing out literature here in Denmark a couple of years ago in 2015, and you know how hard it is to hand out literature? Yes. People say, I, I, are you Lutheran? I'm Lutheran, but I don't want anything to do on, with Luther. You know, 500 years since the Reformation. No thank you, no thank you. It's very hard. In, in Bolivia and most South American countries, Central America, you can't, they take them out of your hands. They grab them before you can even hand them out. People are snatching them out of your hands. So, and and I, I, I just want to add too that two other experiences that we had there that just really touched me. One of them was that afterwards, about 10 or 15 minutes later, we were walking down the street, and here's this little Cholita, this little lady, Indian, Indian lady, lady, just pouring over the lessons. And, and she said, I'm already on lesson number four. And that just blew me away. I couldn't believe it. And the other one that just really touched me, I um, needed to use the restroom. So I took off to this little place that said public bathroom. And, uh, and then the man said, what are you all doing out there on the plaza? And I said, well, we're handing out Bibles because we want people to be ready for Jesus soon coming. And he said, you know what? Just last week, it was raining so hard here. And this whole hallway 
was flooded with water. And I flipped on the light, and nothing happened. And I thought, oh, it must be the light bulb. And he said, I reached up. My feet were in the water. I reached up, and he said, I got this terrible shock. And he said, I tried to let go, and I couldn't. And he said, these scene just flashed in front of my mind that I'm going to die. And I said, Lord, please take care of my family. And, and then he started to fall down. And as he fell down, the whole thing was just yanked out. The whole um, Fixture? wire, yeah. No, wow, okay. And so then all of a sudden, he wasn't being shocked anymore. And he said, I went home and I told my wife. And she said, honey, I think this is a wake up call. We need to get to know God better. And then he said, and now you've walked in with this Bible and these lessons. And, you know, that just really touched my heart. It touched her heart because in Venezuela, she almost got electrocuted, too. <laughs> she went to take th the phone, pick up the phone, and she just came out of the shower. The phone was ringing. She was expecting me to come from the union. I had had a union board meeting. I was coming back home. And she flipped on the light, and she, when she got it, she got shocked, wet feet on cement, and she picked it up, and she was being shocked. She couldn't scream. She couldn't do anything. Only the Lord helped me. And she, nobody could hear her. And, and suddenly a hand hit the light out of her hand, and it flew across the room and broke. Like an angel hit her hand and knocked it out of her hand. And so she knows what it's like to be dying of electrocution. And the Lord saved her life. And, and the Lord told me while I was driving on the bus, you need to pray for your wife right now. So I, I said, what do I pray for? Just pray for your wife. You don't pray for her enough. And, and so I stopped and I prayed for her, but I didn't know what I was praying for. And another friend also was impressed to pray for her. And at that very moment, Satan was trying to take her life. And God saved her life. And we're so glad that you're here today. Yes, and, and the truth is I felt like a terrible, wicked person spirit was there just hoping that I would die and I think he was very disappointed that I didn't and what really impressed me at that time I was reading through Isaiah and the next morning the verse I read was Isaiah 63 verse 9 in all their afflictions he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved him in his love and in his pity he saved them and lifted them and bear them all the days of old. And I just felt the Lord telling me right then, that's exactly what I did for you yesterday. I just picked you up and carried you and saved you. And I just love that verse. And to think that Jesus goes through all of our hard times, all of our afflictions. He feels everything that we're feeling. And the most beautiful thing is that he also lived a perfect life for us. He wants to give us that victory if we'll just accept it. This gives you a little bit of an idea what mission life is like. Full of joy, sometimes tears, but mostly joy. Amen. There's sacrifices, but it's mainly a very big fulfillment. I, we wouldn't do anything else. We worked just a little bit of history. Uh, we began uh, our work for the church when we were very young, just finished the university. And uh, the General Conference called us to work um, in Mexico. And then we went to work in Peru. And then we went to work in the Caribbean. And then we went to work in Venezuela. So we worked in three different unions. I taught at the university for uh, Southern Adventist University, which is I mean, actually it's called Southern Univers the University of the Southern Caribbean, which is our Ad Adventist university. And I, I, I taught graduate business classes for Andrews University for for a period of time. I taught computer science, I taught business, and, uh, and then I, we decided to go back to the jungles of South America and go back into frontline mission service again, working barefoot with the Indians. And so we left the university uh, experience and went back into the jungles. And so, but then from there they called us to me to be ADRA director, and I continued living in the jungles but still carrying on my responsibilities as ADRA director, and then to the union in Venezuela to work with ADRA and communication at the union. Uh, and I did that for six years, uh, almost seven. And then from there, we, when all the Americans had to leave the country because of political problems in Venezuela, you know, you've heard of Venezuela and the problems they're having. 
Uh, all, the, all the American missionaries had to leave. So we left and decided, you know, we've worked 30 years for the church. Maybe we should just be volunteers from now on. And we went to Bolivia. We've been there about seven years. Uh, uh, actually, eight years now. Eight years. And we've been just opening projects all around the world and still volunteers and inviting people to taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. If you've ever wanted to be a volunteer, it doesn't matter what age. Uh, it doesn't matter what your skills are. Uh, believe it or not, some of the hardest skills to find are agriculture. Uh, uh, and then we have maintenance people. And then we have uh, uh, information technology, computers. Uh, sometimes it's easier to find a doctor than it is to find somebody to work in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> and what about cooks? We need cooks too. And so there's a variety of, of skills. When, when you just close your eyes and put your finger on the map, you know, there's a 50% chance that there will be a need there in one of our projects. But also the General Conference is looking for volunteers. Uh, SDAvolunteers.org. With our organization, it's uh, gmivolunteers.org. And so there's, there's plenty of room for you. And if you would like to experience it, you can come for six months. You can come for a year. You might want to stay there if you go. I warn you, you might like it too much. <laughs> and uh, pilots, mechanics, nurses, cooks, teachers, uh, agriculture, information technology, media, just about any kind of skill. If you just like to give Bible studies, there's work too. Or right here at home, I'm sure that there's work also if you can't leave home. Well, thank you, Aunt Becky, very much. Uh, we appreciate you sharing the feminine side of, of the ministry. It, it, it adds a little bit of interest to those who, uh, 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 women who would like to serve in the mission field and they want to know what is it like. I've heard Uncle David, but I want to hear Aunt Becky too. You can see that we work together. Uh, we're traveling together. Many times I travel by myself, but over the years, we finally made up our mind. If I'm gone more than a couple of weeks, we travel together. It used to be that I would be gone a month or six weeks. But now, if it's long, we travel together because toward the end of our life, we just, uh, as we reach the last years, we want to be together more often. Nobody knows how long we have, and it's also safer. It's also safer to be together. You can pray together. You can help each other. And also, at the same time, uh, it's amazing how many how many rumors go around, and it's always better to be together. Uh, an official communication came from, from somebody one time, and it went out all over South America. David and Becky are getting divorced. We go, where did they call me from the union office? They called from a union and said, what? This came from the higher uh, authorities. And we said, we never heard of that before. No, he called my son-in-law and said, call your father-in-law and find out for sure because this came from high up. And, and, and so he called me, he said, but they're not getting divorced. They're in love together. And call and find out. So they call, he called, of course, and we said, no, of course not. And uh, we, we love each other more than we did when we first got married. And, and so then he called and said, stop circulating rumors. So these things happen. And, and uh, we like to travel together because, because we like being together as well. And uh, it's, it's more fun. And now that she could come to Denmark, I'm glad she could come. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to close with uh, this first session. We're going to have another presentation shortly. This first one was more an introduction to mission work, an introduction to our family, and so you can get to know us better. And, and uh, it comes from Psalms 34, uh, 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him and delivereth them. And from Psalms 46, just a, just a, a few pages across, it's one of the Psalms that Sister White says that we should memorize. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There's nothing to fear. Though there's tornadoes, though there's earthquakes, maybe there's an economic earthquake coming. Maybe there is, maybe there is a social earthquake like in so many countries. Maybe there is different types of, of earthquakes. Theologically, there's earthquakes as well, where everything you believe is being questioned. All of these things, we have nothing to fear as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus. And we have learned over the years, I have been hijacked, I've been imprisoned, I've been assaulted by gangs, I've been held up by, by bank robbers, I've had a gun at my head many times, I've been in many, many air aviation airplane emergencies, uh, 
where we thought we were going down and I prayed to the Lord and somehow, somehow we're able to make it to a safe landing. Uh, and, and so we, we go through all these experiences. They're going through terrible storms where, where their plane is going up and down so hard that you can't even hold on to the controls. And everything is flying around the cabin. And, and, and you're wondering if you can control the airplane. And the tower is saying, hello, hello, are you there? Are you there? And I can't even grab the microphone to, to talk to them. You know, and my headphones have come off my head. And, and I'm trying, finally, when we get to the other side of the storm, I just slow the airplane down. Because when an airplane is slow, it can take more, uh, more abrupt uh, attitudes and, and turbulence. So I pull the power back, pull the flaps down, and just hold it and let it go up and let it go down and let it go up and bang, 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 like, like a little tin can with popcorn inside. And, and uh, when we finally come through the other side, then I talk to the tower and they say, are you okay? Yes, we're okay, thank you. Do, do you need an emergency landing? No, the plane is okay, thank you. Uh, do you want to continue to your destination? Yes, we will continue to our destination, thank you. And um, we, we, we think of all these times and we thank the Lord. We're, you know, you are here today because God saved your life. I would like you to ask you today, how many of you know that you are alive today because God intervened to save your life? Can you raise your hand? The more years we live, the more we know that, right? When you're five years old, you may not know that. But when you're 95, you have no doubt whatsoever because you've been through too many experiences. And the longer we live, the more we know that we, have a, we are here because of God's purpose. God has saved our life for a reason. Are you fulfilling the reason? Are you living the dream that God had for you? Do you know that God, God has given you dreams in your heart? Many of us dream of doing something. And when we finally are on our deathbed, we regret not having doing them, not having done them. But God is calling you. He has given you a dream. What is your dream? What, ha what have you always dreamed of doing in your life? If you will give God full control of your life, you will find that God will carry out those dreams in your life. And the longer we wait, many of the dreams that we had when we were younger become harder to do. Uh, my wife and I, some years ago, we ran in a marathon. It was one of our dreams. We wanted to run in a marathon. Now, we only ran half a marathon, 21K. We didn't run 42 kilometers. We ran only 21. But we practiced for about six months, getting ready. Actually, my wife and her sisters decided they were going to do it. And I could not let them do it by themselves. And so I was a little upset because if my wife's going to run in a marathon, how can I, I'm the man in the house, <laughs> how can I not run in a marathon? I can't allow her to do it and not me. So I was a little upset because now I had to practice because I can't run 21K just by getting out of bed one morning. So, so I, we started running one and then two and then three, then one and two and three, then five and then three and then five and then six and seven and then three. And we started doing this and it took time. But all of a sudden I noticed my energy is returning. My health is increasing. And I started to have more energy. And when we ran, we, we, we did very well. She and her three sis two other sisters I ran in the men's group a little further ahead, a little faster. But we, we, all four of us finished safely, and it's a memory come true. Then after that, we were in Estonia, not far from here, and, and she tore her ligament in her leg. And then she did later, a, a year or so later, she dislocated her left shoulder. And now I'm not sure if we're going to run any more marathons. But it was a dream come true, and all of us have dreams. How many of us still have dreams? Raise your hand if you have a dream. Almost all of us. When we're young, we have dreams. When we're old, we have dreams. You can still carry out your dream. We had, a, we had a little lady physician. She worked in Africa for years as a nurse. And then she took medicine. And then she came to work in Haiti. And then she wanted to work with us. And we thought she was a young, younger lady. But when I first saw her, I said, she's in her late 80s. How is she going to work as a missionary? Okay, well, I'll... I'll take you down, and we'll see what you can do. You know what? She worked for over 10 years. She ran the Bible school. She took care of patients. And she only went home, finally, 
after she started forgetting who we were and who she was. <laughs> she would be washing her clothes and we would say, Dr. Sheila. And she would turn to Gary and say, Hello, David, how are you? No, no, Dr. Sheila, I'm Gary, I'm not David. Oh, hi, Gary, nice to meet you. Dr. Sheila, you've known me for a long time. Oh, I thought today was the first day I met you. And then why are you washing your clothes on Sabbath? Is today Sabbath? I didn't know today was Sabbath. And she was forgetting which day it was, who she was, who we were. So we felt it was better for her finally to go home. And we talked to her brother and sister. And they said, bring her, bring her home. So we brought her home. And she stayed a few more years. And then she passed away. But she said, please, my, I want you to take my ashes. And I want you to bury them at the base of Mount Roraima, the mountain that separates Venezuela, Guyana, and Brazil. Bury my ashes there next to the grave of Pastor O.E. Davis, the first mission president for Guyana, British Guyana. I want to be in a resurrection beside his grave. Isn't that a beautiful thing? She worked and carried out her dream until she died. And at the resurrection, her dream was to be raised next to Pastor O.E. Davis, who died, who was poisoned, who was poisoned when he was working there. And uh, uh, we met a little lady, 107 years old, a little Catholic lady. And we went to see her. And she said she remembered Pastor O.E. Davis. And uh, he died in, uh, he died in, I think, in nine, uh, 1911 something. He died. And she remembered him still. And she started singing in English. And she said, Pastor O.E. Davis taught me that when I was a little girl. And so very soon we're going to get to meet our pioneers. We're going to get to meet Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. We're going to get meet, meet our loved ones too that are, we're ready for the second coming. And we want to be ready too. We want to be there when Jesus comes. So we're going to be talking. Uh, I'm going to be presenting some more things one more time, a little more this evening. And then tomorrow as well, we're going to have fun, a, a nice time together. At this time, I would invite you to kneel down with me as we just uh, close in prayer. And we'll, we'll begin our second session with a little bit more presentations. And that'll be for tonight, uh, what we have to present. Should we kneel down together? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these experiences we've been able to share. There are thousands, maybe probably millions of people that are longing every day to find hope, to find truth, to find light. They're asking questions. They want to know what is happening. But Lord, somebody has to go. And all of us have dreams. And many of those dreams you have placed in our hearts, Lord, and we long to carry them out. Please, we pray that those that have this strong desire that you have placed there to serve in some way, in some place, please, Lord, in their lives, bring it about, make it a reality, and fill us with your Holy Spirit. And thank you for encouraging us today with the joy of service. We love you. We thank you. We look forward to your soon coming. In Jesus' name, amen.